in Murray's involuntary manslaughter trial. Now, the judge set, the hearing, set a hearing on this for Monday so that they can discuss this issue. In the meantime, folks, we're talking a lot about propofol. That's one of the drugs at the center of this case. And in sessions, Vinny Politan shows us just how much propofol Lopez says he shipped to Conrad Murray. Tim Lopez owned Applied Pharmacy Services, and he says that between April 6th and June 10th, 2009, Conrad Murray bought propofol, a powerful surgical anesthetic from him, four separate times. Lopez testified at Murray's preliminary hearing. He told the court Murray ordered several hundred bottles of propofol from him. Over the course of about nine weeks, Murray ended up buying more than one, two, three, four gallons of propofol. This is how Conrad Murray's propofol purchases break down. April 6th, Dr. Murray ordered one 10-bottle carton of 100-milliliter vials. Murray also ordered a 25-bottle carton of the smaller size 20-milliliter vials. Three weeks later, on April 28th, Lopez says Dr. Murray ordered 40 bottles of the larger size and 25 bottles of the smaller size. Around May 12th, Lopez says Murray placed the same order as he did on April 28th. 40 more 100 milliliter vials and 25 more of the 20s. And on June 10th, Murray placed his final and largest order with Lopez. 40 100 milliliter vials and 50 20 milliliter vials. That adds up to 130 of the larger bottles and 125 of the smaller bottles of propofol. Toxicology results show that Michael Jackson had propofol levels similar to those found during major surgery. And the Los Angeles medical examiner ruled that the singer died of acute propofol intoxication. Conrad Murray told investigators he only gave Jackson 25 milligrams of propofol the day he died. He has pled not guilty to charges of involuntary manslaughter and denies he gave Michael Jackson the fatal dose. The final phase of Conrad Murray's jury selection is next Friday, and then opening statements are on September 27th. You'll watch it live right here on In Session. So we've been talking all day about who is Michael Jackson. Who's the real Michael Jackson? So I spoke to a panel of people who've known him in various capacities throughout his entire life to really get a better sense for him. And thankfully, our whole panel, or most of our panel, is back with us now to take your calls and answer some questions about everything they talked about, everything we talked about just a couple weeks ago. Good to see each one of them. Steve Manning, close friend of, the Michael, ja of Michael Jackson and the Jackson family, investigative journalist Diane Diamond, and Michael's former bodyguard, Mike Garcia. I want to let you know, Anthony DeCurtis of Rolling Stone, who was with us that day, was not able to be with us today. But uh, guys, I'm so glad you're here. Now, let me, let me first ask each of you, because this was an in-depth interview, but we all, I think, felt like we needed more time to really explain what we wanted to say. I'll give each of you a chance to step in on this one. What did you, what, what did you want to say that you didn't get a chance to say when we had that discussion in New York? Let me start with you, Steve. Well, um, thank you very much. I've been getting a lot of calls all day from all around the country saying how good your show was. Um, I think it showed a good side of him. Um, a lot of things I disagree with that Diane said, but you know, so the, the fair game. But I think that uh, it showed he was a human being, a truly kind person. It showed a different side of him. It, it, it was a good perspective overall. I think it showed the whole, whole side of him, I, I would say. Okay, Diane, what about you? Well, you know, I think uh, in the discussion of Michael Jackson, <laughs> there's way too much talk about Diane Diamond. Okay, I am I happen to be a reporter, a journalist. Uh, I, I earn my living that way. I uh, apologize for nothing, and I began covering him in 1993. And so I too, like Steve, have heard from a lot of people. Twitter, Facebook, my email is clogged today about wow, look at what what True TV in session is doing today. We love the show. Um, I think we should focus on Michael Jackson, the man, and that's what we did when we sat down with you for all those hours. And it's not about Diane Diamond. Yeah. That's what I, that's what I would like to add. Okay. Mike, what about you? I um, mean, you know, a lot of things in which, uh, you know, Steve mentioned on, I think it was, um, I think it was a good show. It showed a lot of things as far as who he was as a person, um, his relationship with the fans and things like that. So, um, a lot of things, again, what Steve said, um, it, it was a good show and, um, there's a few things, you know, in which I didn't agree with, with, with Diane and, uh, you know, it was a good show overall. 
Well, what didn't you agree with? Was there anything you didn't agree with that you didn't have a chance to talk about while we were sitting down? Um, just the way that she was kind of, you know, insinuating about, um, you know, about being a pedophile and things like that. You know what I mean? Um, I, I didn't, I didn't really care for it. So, you know, topics like that. Diana, I'll let you speak on it. Gee, gee, Ryan, did did I say did I say that during all the time that we were sitting there talking about it? You know, look, here here is what I would <clears> like <throat> everyone to remember. Michael Jackson was a genius. He was unparalleled in his talent. He was also a human being. He was not a deity. He had a lot of layers to him. And like a lot of truly creative people, he had some demons. I, I told you during the course of the hours that we talked, I thought the demons, the seeds, started in his childhood, uh, his abusive father. His mother, frankly, who I think should have probably stepped in and said, hey, Joseph, don't treat our children like that. But Michael Jackson is a man who achieved great things and, 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 and hit way high heights, but he also had some very low moments in his life. And it's not right to only discuss just the high points. He's a man of many layers and many textures, and, and we should talk about all of them. You know, Steve, we talk of Diane talking about the many layers, the many areas, and that's a lot of what we tried to get at with this. But, Steve, I think that this trial, I think a lot of fans of Michael Jackson say, well, we want to believe all the positive and wonderful things he did in his life. But do you think looking ahead to this trial, especially in recent weeks, we're starting well, no, to Ryan, talk let more me say, about like the say drug use? I didn't Go say, ahead. I didn't say this during the last show. But you know what? This man was found not guilty. People have forgotten this. He was found not guilty. Absolutely. And why should guilty. his... Absolutely. And why, and why should the, the, the trial tarnish his astonishing historic uh, record of, of his musical career? I mean, it's very unfortunate. It's very right. unfair. Well, well, Steve, I, unfair. I, think, I think the flip side of that is, and again, I, I understand what you're saying about the molestation trial. What I'm asking here is when we talk about his drug use, which I think is already coming up a lot in the press, I think it's something that okay. the defense is going to try to introduce at this trial. Do you think that is going to affect his legacy? I wouldn't say so because, again, what really happened? We, maybe we'll find out in the trial what really happened. Maybe Dr. Murray will really come out uh, forthright and say what really happened that night. I mean, the, the, what, what really happened that night? What really happened? Was that a control? Could, could have been some um, intervention? You know, we'll find out about that during the trial, hopefully. You know, Mike, uh, you just saw Vinnie Politan's piece on this propofol. You see those four gallons. You know, I always want to mention when we talk about those four gallons, we don't know for sure if that all went for Michael Jackson, so that's one question that's that needs to be answered. But, Mike, you talked about Conrad Murray. You talked about interacting with him, seemed like a nice guy. When you hear things coming out now about this, the propofol, all those drugs he ordered, those drugs on that nightstand, I know we got into it a little bit in the interview, but what do you think now of this man that you met earlier, and he seemed like a guy who was trying to take care of Michael Jackson, but this stuff that's coming out, it just makes you shake your head. You, um, my first thought was, uh, when I watched that was the fact that, you know, he, he has many clients, you know, that he, that he pertains to. So, um, you know, to say it was all for Mr. Jackson, I think that would be kind of ludicrous, to, you know, to, to speculate on. But, he, you know, he, um, I can't really comment on that. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I mean, he's a doctor and he's in his profession and there's, you know, it didn't have Mr. Jackson's name on it, so why, why even think that? It's a good point, Mike. And, and like I well, said, again, know, for sure, we don't know if it's his. Go ahead, Diane. Diane. I was just going to say, Ryan, you, you know, Dr. Murray is a cardiologist. He's not an anesthesiologist. And propofol is for use only by anesthesiologists who are licensed in the state in which it's used. So, no, we don't know exactly where all that propofol was supposed to go, but I think the only no, person that Conrad Murray was administering it to was Michael Jackson. Yeah, I, I think, I think that that's your, I think that's your opinion, to take it though, overseas Diane. on the concert tour. Go ahead. I see one of you well, jumping. You know what, Ryan? Go ahead, Steve. Ryan, I would say something about this. You know, there's a lot of politics involved in this whole case and a lot of money. Who knows? He ordered this and probably charged Michael a fortune for that. Who knows? Also, remember, he's getting $150,000 right. a, a, a month. Right. Good point. So that, pro, that, that drug might have cost a fortune, too, and put that to the side. Who knows? Yeah, but, but Steve, I mean, this, the, we'll issue still becomes, he, Steve, the issue still becomes, even if he's paying you $150,000 a month, why are you ordering and administering this drug? And again, because I want to say this, and by the way, folks, I just want to make this really clear. We do not have proof right now that all of those four gallons of propofol that were ordered were used exclusively for Michael Jackson. Diane draws a good parallel, though, which is he was working for Michael Jackson at that time, and he was getting paid all this money, Almost so it does draw that connection.
But go ahead, Steve. What, well, look, well, Ryan, couldn't we say also that po the possibility that, that Dr. Dr. Conrad Murray um, ordered this stuff and, you know, build Michael in, uh, astronomical fees, I mean, for, for the drug? Who knows? Hopefully we'll find out. There could be many reasons. There could be many reasons. And to sit there and say that it was just for Mr. Jackson, I think that's it's ludicrous. Well, again, we're not saying it's just for Michael Absolutely. Jackson, but, but I understand what you guys are saying. You guys are saying there could be mm -hmm. other alternatives there. But, Mike as, you look at this, Absolutely. Mike, as you look at this trial, though, what do you think of Dr. Murray's chances of acquittal? I mean, some have said, I, I've talked to many lawyers who've said, hey, I thought this was going to be a civil case. It ends up being a criminal case because it involves Michael Jackson. Do you think it will lead to an acquittal? Or as you're starting to look at the information come in, and again, we'll find out more when the trial starts, what does it look like for you it, in terms of a decision? Um, it's, you know what? It, it, it can go either way. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about a high-profile uh, person. And, um, you know, I try not to look, at, you know, look too much into the news and things like that about it. Um, it's not going to bring Mr. Jackson back. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a, to me, it's a sad situation what's going on. And, it, you know, if, if he didn't get involved in the things that he's being accused of and, and he does get, you know, sent to prison, you know, it would be a, you know, a devastating thing. But... You know, I don't, I don't pay t too much attention to it because, um, like I said, it's not going to bring Mr. Jackson back. But does it set up a conflict for you? This is a man that you worked for. You spoke so highly of him. And at the same time, mm -hmm. the doctor that you knew might be the man who's responsible for taking this man. I met Mr. Doctor, I, I met mm -hmm. Dr. Murray. I'm not going to, you know, um, sit here and say that, you know, we hung out and all that kind of stuff. You know, we, okay. I met Dr. Murray. He seemed like a very nice man. You know, he, he, in, in his actions, in the words he spoke, he, he seemed like he was looking for the best interests of Mr. Jackson. And I mean, that's the only thing I can really comment on. Okay, Diane Diamond, as you see this case shaping up, I think, uh, like we're talking about, there's a lot of attention being focused on the drugs. There's a lot of attention being focused on what Dr. Murray did. As you see this shaping up, and we just talked about recently, the prosecution's having trouble finding the pharmacist, and of course that's going to make it more difficult to link Dr. Murray to administering these drugs. It messes with the prosecution's case a little bit. How do you see this playing out, at least in terms of what we might see in court? Well, I think it depends on the prosecution's presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every time I sit in a courtroom, um, for example, sitting in uh, at the criminal trial for Michael Jackson, I watch the storyline. Is the prosecution giving a cohesive storyline that takes me from A to B to C to because that's really w what it is? It's presentation to the jury, not to us watching out here in America. And uh, I think that the defense has been dealt uh, several blows. Uh, they, the judge in this case has made it very clear that what happened in that room that night is what matters, not what Michael Jackson's finances were at the time, which might have been causing him stress and maybe caused him to use more drugs, uh, not how many drugs he used in the past. The judge has shut the door on a lot of avenues for the defense. So I think the prosecution naturally has a leg up. You have a doctor who's not supposed to be using this stuff because he's not licensed. You've got him using it in a home, not a hospital, which is illegal. Um, I think if the prosecution doesn't make it too complicated, I'm, I'm thinking of the OJ case and Marsha Clark, for example, that became so complicated. Mm. I think the prosecution's got a good chance of winning this case. All right, Diane, Steve, Mike, I just want to thank you, by the way, for your honesty during our interview. Thank Even you. now, I know you guys go at it sometimes, thank but we having. appreciate it because this is not a simple topic, and you're talking about all different sides no. of Michael Jackson in this case. Appreciate that, and I appreciate you guys sticking around because you're going to be helping us take some calls very soon. Our viewers are going to call in, ask any question you have to any of our panelists. Give us a call, 1877-JURA-13.